Philippians chapter 3. And we have made our way down to verse number 10. First few verses of chapter 3 talked about dealing with false teachers. And then uh, we looked last week. Paul said, look, we don't have any reason to trust in the flesh. Look what I've accomplished. And that means nothing. However, what does mean something is who I am in Christ. And the righteousness that I have in Christ. We finished with verse 9 last week. It says, and be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And so he's talking about when we become a Christian, we are now in Christ. What does that mean? It means that Jesus' righteousness has covered us. We're in him. When God looks at us, he no longer sees our failures and sins. He sees the righteousness of Christ. And that's why we get heaven uh, when we die if you're a Christian. So verse 9 talks about salvation, and then we get into verse number 10 and 11. And we'll just look at these two verses for a Bible study tonight. The Bible says in verse 10 of Philippians 3, that I may know him. If I had to sum up Paul's desire as a Christian, I think those five words would uh, ring true through all the New Testament. He said, I just want to know Christ, that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. We're going to look tonight at the Christian's quest to know Christ. I hope it's your desire oh, yeah. to know Christ. Like Paul said, I just want to know him. There's three things we can know. We're going to look at that. In our brief Bible study tonight, let's ask God's blessing as we jump into this. Lord, thank you for the encouraging time we've had together, singing of you, worshiping you, bringing requests to you. Now we study your word. Make it come alive to us, please. It is alive. Just a matter of if we'll hear it the appropriate way as we looked at Sunday. May we be a, uh, have a committed mind to receive your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 9, he covered salvation and so when we get to verse 10 and he says that i may know him he's not referring to knowing him as savior he's already covered that uh he's speaking of knowing the one who saved him in fact i'm going to read this by fb meyer he says this we may know him personally intimately face to face christ doesn't live back in the centuries think about that nor amid the clouds of heaven He's near us, with us, compassing our path and our lying down and acquainted with all our ways. I'm going to get back to this quote in just a moment. But we don't have to think of Christ as someone that was way back in Bible days or someone that's up in heaven. He's with us today. Keep that in mind. We cannot know him in this mortal life except through the illumination and teaching of the Holy Spirit. And we must surely know Christ, not as a stranger who turns in to visit for the night, or as the exalted king of men. There must be the inner knowledge, as of those whom he counts his own familiar friends, whom he trusts with his secrets, who eat with him of his own bread. To know Christ in the storm of battle, to know him in the valley of shadow, to know him when the solar light irradiates our faces, or when they are darkened with disappointment and sorrow. To know the sweetness of his dealing with bruised reeds and smoking flax, to know the tenderness of his sympathy, the strength of his right hand. All this involves many varieties of experiences on our part, but each of them, like the facets of a diamond, will reflect the prismatic beauty of his glory from a new angle. It should be our desire to know Christ. To know Him as we go through this, as we go through that, as we, as, as we uh, walk down this stage of life, as we enter in this experience, to know Christ in a different way. That should be our desire. What sets Christianity apart? You see, religion is satisfied with rights and systems and regulations and rules. But the Christian should just want to know Christ. You can know rules and preferences and know all the right things to do and still not know Him. You see, if I would, were to ask you how many of you know our president, how many of you know Donald Trump, I think we'd all know him. But how many of you really know him? I don't think any of us would. 
I got to meet someone uh, uh, two weeks ago. Uh, you know, before you watch, this has nothing to do with the message, but I just thought it was neat. Uh, before you watch something like the, uh, the State of the Union address, there's always someone that comes in, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, the, the voice that I got, got to meet the guy that, that was that for President Clinton and President Bush. And so that's kind of neat. He goes to church at Pastor Johnson's in Shasta now. So uh, anyway, he was the announcer for the wedding I was in. I was like, he's pretty good at that. And he said, yeah, he did it for president. So, anyway. None of us know Donald Trump, right? If I were to ask how many of you know Jesus, we all would raise our hand. But the question is, do we really know him? We should never rest until we know him as we know our friend. And are able to read without speech the movements of his soul, Matthew Meyer said. So here are the three things we should know as we study this tonight. Number one, know his power. Know his power that I may know him. That word know doesn't just talk about a, a transcendent knowledge, a vast knowledge of something or someone. It talks about an intimate bond with someone. That's Paul's desire. I want to know him, know his power, first of all, through a relationship. He says that, that I may know him. He talked about the relationship in verse number nine. The initial saving knowledge of Christ becomes, watch this, the basis, the foundation of a lifelong pursuit of even deeper knowledge of God. Don't let just being a Christian be sufficient for your knowledge of Christ. That should be the foundation, the basis, the starting point. We want to move on from there. Every Christian should desire to know Christ, watch this, not just in a life-changing way, that was salvation, but in a life-shaping way, that's sanctification. I want to know Him so much that it shapes what I do and say today. I want to know Him so much that it shapes how I think and how I act and what I say today. Do you know Christ in that way? Through a relationship. But not just know His power through a relationship, but He says, I want to know His power through His resurrection. This is good stuff. Paul gladly exchanged his lack of life Experience and knowledge for Christ's resurrection power. Notice it says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That word power has the idea carrying with it a thing by virtue of its nature. The power of God through the Holy Spirit. What are you talking about? Each one of you, if you're a child of God, has the Holy Spirit living inside of you and has this power residing within you. Think about that for a moment. We all have the power of Christ inside our hearts and lives right now. Don't tell me you can't get over this. Truth of the matter is you can't, but you have the power to do so inside you. You're a child of God. Pastor, I just can't get over this. I can't figure this out. You have the power inside of you. And Paul said, I want to know him and I want to know that power. The power that resurrected Christ. Just as Christ could not be held by death. We have the power to conquer things in life as well. Whatever it is, no matter how difficult it might seem. Again, an unbeliever is never going to understand that. Never going to understand the life-changing power of Christ's resurrection. Think about every other God, so to speak, in every other religion. They're all dead. Not one of them's alive. But our God conquered death. And with that power of the resurrection, which is the reason we're saved. I mean, what He did on the cross... Incredible, wonderful, but without the resurrection, useless. Understand the power of the resurrection? 1 Corinthians 15 goes in detail in that. But that power that raised him from the dead is living inside of us. So we want to know his power, the resurrection. The resurrection power provides renewal. Listen to these verses. You don't have to turn there. You can write it down if you'd like. 2 Corinthians 4, 14 to 16. Say this. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Here it is. For which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Doesn't matter what's going on around us, inside we can be renewed. Why? Because of the power of His resurrection. That lives inside of us. 
So it doesn't matter what's happening in the world and what's going on. As a Christian, we can still have joy because of the power of the resurrection. As a Christian, we can still conquer because of the power of the resurrection. As a Christian, we can still move forward with a smile on our faces. How? Because of the power of the resurrection. That's what Paul wants to know here. That's what should be what we want to know. It provides renewal. It provides ministry, unction. Uh, I love these, past, th these verses. I'm going to read them 1 Corinthians 2. And, and Paul says this, as he's standing before men, he says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul tells them, look, I do what I do. I don't want to do it because I can or because I have this ability, but Christ has, has enabled me to preach, and I want to preach with His power, because His power can change your life. So, Paul is not only saying that the power will provide renewal for me to go forward, but it will also provide the strength to do what I do. You need strength to do what you do, live as a Christian? We all need that. Guess what? We can have it. And in fact, it's already inside. This stuff you'll hear in the world of tapping to your inner self, hogwash. The, more, the, the deeper you go in of you, the more wicked it gets. But remembering that we're in Christ... And His Holy Spirit resides within us. The deeper inside we go, the more power we get. Because of Jesus. We want to know His power. Second of all, in this passage, we want to know His presence. Paul wants to know His presence. He says that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. And the next part's not so fun. And the fellowship of His suffering. I'll choose the first phrase. The power of His resurrection. Skip over the fellowship of His suffering. Talking about, I want to know his presence, a personal fellowship. This fellowship of his suffering is personal, it's communion, to suffer for Christ. Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus, you know, in the last three verses, last three words say, shall suffer persecution. Paul walked with Christ. Warren Wearsby said, prayed, obeyed his will, and sought to glorify his name when he was living under law. All Paul had was a set of rules. But now he had a friend, a master, a constant companion. That's the wonderful thing about not being under law, but being under grace. We go through what we go through, and we have someone in Jesus who says, I'm right here beside you. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace. We often forfeit. What needless pain we bear because we don't carry everything to God in prayer. He wants to walk beside us in your personal suffering. We can know His presence. Personal fellowship. But then, I think we'll all be able to agree to this. An experienced fellowship. Not just a personal fellowship, but experience fellowship. We often learn the most about Christ during times of suffering and trials. It's sad to say it, but when you look back over your life, you learn the most about Christ during difficult times. Philippians 1.10 shows us that when we suffer, we have a companion in Him who suffered far more than we ever will. But He'll stick with us through all our suffering. Hebrews chapter 12, these are familiar verses, verse uh, 2 and 3 say this. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. It, it's easy to get weary in today's world and faint in our minds in today's world. Paul saying, hold on, just consider him for a moment who went through so much more and he's here to walk beside you with what you're going through. Now, all of a sudden, knowing his presence, it takes care of a lot of things. 
We can know His power as a child of God. We can know His presence as a child of God. And very quickly, we'll go through this last one. We can know His perfection. Verse 11. Know His perfection. It's a spiritual goal that Paul has. He says in verse 11, If by any means I might attain. That word attain means to achieve or accomplish, to reach by his efforts. He's not being proud as he says this. He says, I, I want to get to a point where I reach the resurrection of the dead. Not, not physically, I want to get to a point where I die. That's not what he's saying here. Uh, but he never got over his own unworthiness. We can see that in a lot of different uh, of the books that he wrote. 1 Corinthians 15 says, for I am the least of the apostles. I'm not meant to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. He understood his unworthiness. That even though God was using him to do great things, he also was a tool of the devil to destroy the church at one time in his life. But he says, I, I want to get to the point, I, I want to reach the, the resurrection of the dead. Spiritually speaking, I, I have a spiritual goal. I want to be made like Christ. I want to know Him so much. I want my life to show the power of His resurrection. And as I go through these hard times, I think, I think Paul knew the fellowship of his sufferings. Yeah. What do you say? He's writing this from where? Yeah. Right. right. And that's where he wrote many of his books. He, he, he went through difficult times. He, he has a list of how he was stoned and shipwrecked and this and beaten and left for dead and kept going. Because he knew the fellowship. I believe he knew Christ. Being made conformable unto his death. We have a spiritual goal. Then we see an eternal relationship. The resurrection of the dead. At conversion. I'll read this other quote. My study. I want to read this. At conversion believers experience the power of a spiritual resurrection. They're given new life. A new spiritual energy characterizes the new life in Christ. Yet this powerful life only begins at conversion. We talked about this earlier. Successively, progressively, the moral life must be changed. The physical body ultimately transformed. And believers brought to the eternal resting place of resurrection, heaven itself. The transformation doesn't happen at once. It culminates in the attaining of the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection occurs at the time of the Lord's return to earth. That will finalize the application of resurrection power to the Christian. Here's what we're talking about. When we get saved, we're justified. Right? But it's the beginning of sanctification. Watch this. Justification happens here at the moment of salvation. One day when Jesus returns or when we get to heaven, we'll be glorified. Justification, glorification. It means we're made like Christ. We're perfect. Okay? How many of you, when you got saved, were perfect? Okay, none of us. How many of us right now are perfect? None of us. One day we all will be. If you're like me, we got a ways to go from here to here. That's this life right now. Paul says, I want to know Christ so much. I become so much like him. That I get to this point. That's my goal. That's my desire. We'll never reach this point here on earth. I'll never forget some things that are written in my dad's Bible. I have over in my office. Uh, he, he, one thing he wrote. And it was in, I'm almost positive, it was in the book of Philippians. I might have to go check tonight. At the top it says, I want to live as much like Christ today. So that when I get to heaven, there doesn't have to be much of a change. Let me ask you. Is there going to have to be much of a change in our life? Yes. Over the last year, I don't think I've done much preaching on specifics of get this out of your life and preaching on this specific sin and add this to it. I'm not against those things. We'll get to those things. But the truth of the matter is... We're all Christians and we've all got the Holy Spirit living inside of us and we should all be at a point where He can say that to us and we just do it. Why? Because we want to get to that glorification. We've experienced justification. If we haven't, none of this matters. Doesn't matter how much you do on the outside until the insides change. But it, at sanctification, I'm sorry, at justification begins the process of sanctification. He says, I, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead, because of our resurrection, because of our glorification, I could read you more verses, but I think we understand what's happening here. Paul says that, that I may know him. What is your goal and desire as a Christian? I hope it is to know Christ. What do you mean to know Christ? Well, to know his power. 
to know His presence and to know His perfection. We know many, we know about many and various things in this world. We probably know many various things about the Bible. But Paul's one great desire, the yearning of his heart, his consuming passion, his relentless, relentless quest was to know God. May that be our quest as well. Why do we have church all the time? Why do we have these services? Now we're going back to two services again on Sunday? Come on now. We want to know Christ. We want to uplift Him. Life's not all about church. I've seen, I uh, heard it, heard it uh, said, and, and I believe that church is more like the huddle that goes on in a football game. It's so that we're all on the same page and we're all running the right play. But then we need to go out and do it. Church is a pep rally, an exciting time, meet together, but hold on, now let's go live life throughout the rest of the week, living like Christ. Remembering what we got from the playbook in the huddle. Right. Go and tell others, come join our team. Doesn't have to be just 11 on 11, right? We can get more people on Christ's team. We're on the winning side. Praise the Lord for that. But let's not be satisfied with where we are. Let's press forward to know Christ, know His power and His his perfection and to know his presence. Thank you for listening. Let's bow our heads and hearts together for prayer.